Good evening and welcome. Tonight we'll be going over the history and geography of Egypt. Egypt is probably one of the more famous countries in Africa in that it's one of the countries of Africa that everyone learns about in school. Everyone learns about ancient Egypt. So it's one of the reasons I'm excited to get to this video because ancient Egypt is very cool. As is modern Egypt. We're going to learn about all of Egypt. So let's start with geography. Egypt borders Libya over here. It borders Sudan over here. Let's talk about this border with Sudan really quickly. Let me move book out the way. We'll look through this after I go over history. The, um, there's a triangle right here that is claimed by both Sudan and Egypt. It looks like, um, most people distinguish this part as Egypt and this part as Sudan, at least. Um, this is administered by Egypt. It's all very contentious. The Red Sea coastline is very valuable, as you can imagine. But there is this little bit right here that neither Egypt nor Sudan claims. It is absolutely barren. There is nothing there. Um, I think this is the beer towel wheel, I think it's called. And nobody administers it. Nobody wants it. And I think that's neat. It's the only unclaimed land left on earth. I think that's interesting. And then Egypt, as you can see, has this long coastline with the Red Sea. And then we have a border here with Israel and the West Bank of Palestine. And a little bit of a border with Jordan, just a tiny bit. This area here is known as the Sinai Peninsula, named after Mount Sinai right here which is a very important place in the Bible. It's where Moses received the Ten Commandments from God. And it's also home to the Suez Canal, which cuts through right here and creates a shipping port from Asia up to Europe. It's one of the most important shipping lanes in the world, probably the most important. But by far the biggest geographic feature of Egypt would be the Nile River. It's, Egypt exists because of the Nile River, and you can see just how many towns and cities surround this river. And that's mainly because everything else in Egypt is a lot of nothing. It's the Sahara Desert. You can see here it's called the Great Sand Sea. It's a lot, lot, lot of nothing. And like I always say, you can tell when nothing's there when the borders are just straight lines. They're just delineated because there is nothing to demarcate the borders. This area down here is known as the Libyan Desert, and there are various oases dotted around this area. You can see that these roads link them together, but everything else is pretty bare, and there's a neat depression down here, but it's also a lot of nothing, <laughs> pretty much. So let's talk about the Nile one more time. You can see the big delta right here, very important place, the Nile Delta. You can find the capital city of Cairo here, as well as Giza, where the pyramids are, and the city of Alexandria, which we'll talk about in its history. Luxor was also, uh, once upon a time, a very important city. It was known as Thebes. Aswan is another one. You can see right here is Lake Nasser and it's home to the Aswan Dam. We'll talk about the Aswan Dam and its history a little bit, but when this lake was created, it would have flooded this right here, Abu Simbel, this massive temple built by Ramses II. So they took apart the temple piece by piece, block by block, and moved it up to higher land so that it wouldn't be flooded under the water. But the dam is very important because the Nile floods, which is why there's so many towns and cities next to it, because you could farm all of that rich soil that is created by the flood water. But now thanks to the dam, they can control the floods a lot easier. So 
farming seasons aren't unpredictable anymore. Um, let me see if there's anything else I needed to mention. Let's see. Not so much. You can see the Gulf of Aqaba right there. The Nile flows out to the Mediterranean Sea. Very important because, you know, you, you think when you look at a map that rivers always flow in this direction, but the Nile flows in this direction. So when they talk about Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt in its history, this is Upper Egypt. This is Lower Egypt, even though Lower Egypt is in the north because the water is flowing down to the lower parts from the upper parts. Very important to note. The, the Nile goes into the Mediterranean Sea. It's still an incredibly important river. Always has been. Always will be. So with that being said, let's transition into history. History starts out very, very, very long ago. There's actually a very interesting valley about here or so where there are whale bones, which means that this used to be underwater. Very old prehistoric whale bones from extinct whales. The Sahara area used to be a very lush, kind of savanna forested area with lots of animals and the early humans that lived there um, depicted the, the lifestyle that they lived in their art. But the people who lived in Egypt lived very different lives because the people out in the sand areas had their own lifestyle and once the sand of the Sahara took over they lost that lifestyle but the people of the Nile had it good like all the time because like I said the Nile River flooded every single year and it would leave behind very rich mineral silt in the soil and it was perfect for farming the first farming would have begun around 8000 BCE with the first evidence of civilization and people around 10, the 10th millennium BCE or so. So this area is one of the cradles of civilization. There's a couple of them in the world, but this is an important one. When you have farms, you have people who run the farms. And in this case, the people who ran the farms said, you know, I create the floods from the gods. I'm actually a god. You can call me the pharaoh. <laughs> so that's how we get the kingdom established. Like I said, by 6000 BCE, we had Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt. They were eventually united around 3150 BCE by King Manes. He was the first pharaoh of an era known as the Old Kingdom. He would have been the first dynasty of pharaohs. There were many, I want to say around 35. In the third dynasty, a pharaoh named Djoser built a pyramid for his tomb. It didn't look like the pyramids at Giza. It was a step pyramid, and compared to the later pyramids, it looks a little sloppy. But the fourth dynasty is when the Giza pyramids were built, the largest one for pharaoh Khufu. And, of course, they're an iconic image, not just of Egypt, but of ancient civilization in general. The Middle Kingdom um, was created due to internal political conflict. Things fell apart. And at the beginning of what was becoming to be the Middle Kingdom, they were invaded by a people known as the Hyksos. And the Hyksos ruled Egypt for quite a while. They were eventually driven out by Ophmos I, and that sparked the beginning of the New Kingdom. And the New Kingdom is really when a lot of figures and tropes of ancient Egypt really sprung up that we know of today. Besides the pyramids, they didn't build pyramids in the New Kingdom. But this is when we get Hatshepsut, the female pharaoh. We get Akhenaten, who was a very eccentric pharaoh in that he decided to create monotheism, the first ever monotheistic religion with Aten, the sun god, and he built intense temples over at the capital here, he created his own town nearby for worship of the sun god, but when he died, his son Tutankhamun undid all of it. He said, forget my crazy dad, 
Um, forget my crazy mom, Nefertiti, who went along with it. We're going back to the old ways, the old art style, the old tombs and everything. And, um, everyone knows Tutankhamun because he was very famously found in the 1920s with his tomb perfectly intact. One of the very, very few tombs in Egypt that are like that. This was also when we have Ramses II, who expanded the Egyptian empire considerably during his reign. I also need to mention during the 25th dynasty, the Nubians came and conquered Egypt and ruled both Egypt and what's now the kingdom down in Sudan. It was known as the Kushite down in Meroe, following the Nile. I need to mention that because there is a man named Taharqa who was the pharaoh of both lands. And there is a person who always comments in my videos whenever the slightest chance of Taharqa can be mentioned. He is the biggest Taharqa fan alive. So this is Taharqa's moment. And um, Taharqa guy, I hope you appreciate that because he wasn't Egyptian, but he ruled part of Egypt for a moment. In 525 BCE, Egypt was conquered by the Achaemenid Persians. And it was part of the Persian Empire for a long time until Alexander the Great rode through. And the Egyptians were very glad to see someone who was not Persian come in and tell them that he was taking over. He had already battled with the Persians and won for a little bit. He hadn't fully defeated them yet, but he swung by Egypt, liberated the area here declared himself the pharaoh and founded Alexandria, named after himself. He founded a lot of towns and cities named after himself, but Alexandria, Egypt, is by far the most famous. It became a very flourishing little island community there on the Mediterranean. Eventually, though, Alexander died not long after this episode, and his empire was divided up among his generals, and this area was given to a general known as Ptolemy, and that started the Ptolemaic dynasty as Ptolemy was crowned pharaoh. And the most famous of the Ptolemaic pharaohs was Cleopatra. She was actually Cleopatra the Seventh, and she was the last pharaoh of Egypt, mainly because the Roman Empire on that end of the Mediterranean was growing in strength. She attempted to sort of play the Romans a bit. She seduced Julius Caesar and even had a kid with him, but um, after he was killed, she hooked up with his main general, Mark Antony, who was sort of the one in line to inherit Rome, but um, Augustus, Julius Caesar's nephew, stood up and took it anyway. So there's a bit of a war between Augustus and Mark Antony and Cleopatra, and Augustus Caesar went out and took over Egypt and it became a territory of Rome. And eventually, once Rome split into two, it became part of the Byzantine Empire, which was the Eastern Roman Empire. The Christians in the area were heavily persecuted by the Byzantines for a moment before they weren't. Um, the Romans in general in ancient Rome weren't too fond of Christians. So the Christians in this area, being isolated from other Christians around the world, formed their own version of Christianity, which is known as Coptic Christianity, which is still around to this day. I'll show you pictures in the book of the Coptic Christians, their own very distinct form of Christianity. That was established in 451 CE due to an Egyptian Bible translation. Eventually, though, the Byzantines would embrace Christianity and they would no longer persecute the Christians. In the 7th century, the Sassanids invaded. They were pretty much the empire that sprung up out of the ashes of the Achaemenid Empire over in Persia. So the Persians once again took control, but not for long. The Byzantine Empire fought with them for control until the Arabs invaded in 642 CE and brought with them Islam. And Islam is still the dominant religion in Egypt today. Once again, since the Egyptians were pretty much stuck to the Nile and their culture just grew and evolved with whatever cultures were coming in to the area, 
a, a form of mystical Islam called Sufism, or a, a Sufi a Muslim, sprung up in the area. There's Sufis in various other parts of the world, but uh, there's a really interesting, distinct form in Egypt. The Crusades swung around here for a bit to try to liberate the Muslims out of here, but it was not to be. The Abbasid Caliphate was in charge at this point. A few other caliphates came and went, mainly due to rebellions of the people in Egypt. But in 1250, the Mamluks took control. The Mamluks were the warrior class, and they weren't treated very well in the hierarchy of things. They were more like warrior slaves in a way, in the way that they were treated and just used as pawns in battles. So they rose up and took over the government, and they ruled for quite a long, long, long time until 1517 when the Ottomans invaded, which was the Byzantine Empire that the Muslims had invaded and created their own empire up there. And it stretched down into Egypt. I hope this is all making sense. This is a whirlwind of history, but Egypt has a very long history. The Mamluks were kind of cut off from a lot of power. They were still there. They still had some control, but they were basically fiefs to the Ottomans. The Portuguese were actually controlling most of the trade coming out of here. And there would be lots of different power struggles with the, uh, the semi-autonomy of the Mamluks and the Ottoman Empire and all of that. Until 1798, Napoleon invaded... Napoleon, uh, with his huge ego, decided that he was going to conquer Egypt just like Alexander the Great did. And um, it didn't go too great, but he did hold control for a minute. And then once he lost control of Europe, there was a power vacuum here in Egypt. And there was a lot of clashes between the Ottomans, the Mamluks, and the soldier class of the Ottomans who were from Albania. They, um, you know, were all fighting each other until one of those Albanian soldiers managed to win out in 1805. His name was Muhammad Ali Pasha, and his dynasty was one of territorial gain, military strength. He built up a huge military and lots of economic growth. He's considered the father of modern Egypt, establishing Egypt as we know it today. It remained a vassal state to the Ottomans, but it was fairly corrupt in terms of finances. They went bankrupt pretty quickly, despite all of the economic growth and prosperity happening in the country. It was around this time that the British decided to go all in to start building the Suez Canal along with other helps from other <laughs> European countries. That was completed in 1869. Egypt sold it to the British to pull them out of their bankruptcy. And Britain saw this as sort of a open door to slowly taking control of Egyptian politics, which they did and would eventually invade in 1882. Let me turn my notes real quick, real quick. I have so many notes for Egypt. This is one of the countries I had to make the most notes for, just because, as you can tell, so much is happening. They invaded, and it became a British protectorate under the Ottoman control, which the, the people here in Egypt felt like they were losing their land more and more. There was a big nationalist movement. It led to a really horrible massacre of Egyptians in 1906. But that only fuel, fueled more nationalistic movements. In 1914, World War I had broken out. The Sultan at the time decided to support the Ottomans because he didn't want to support the British. The British didn't like that. They removed him from power, put his brother in charge, and this Sultan declared the independence from the Ottomans and sort of went all in on the British side because he was planted there, right? Uh, a revolt really broke out at this point. A nationalist group known as the Waft Party um, started to grow in prominence. 
and fight against the British. Eventually, in 1922, the country would gain full independence from Britain and create a political structure where the Waft Party could be an actual political party and they were the dominant one for a long time. They had to force the British out. The British did not want to leave, especially the Suez Canal. They um, withdrew eventually um, after World War II because they wanted to protect this. They didn't want the Nazis or the Italians to lay claim to the Suez Canal because they would lose so much if they did so, but they would eventually get the British out by 1952. The first Arab-Israeli war broke out in 1948 in response to the creation of Israel. Just keep that in mind. Um, there was a coup of the government, um, I believe also in 1952, led by Jamal Abdel Nasser. And he removed the monarchy, made it a complete parliamentary, I'm not sure the term, he would become prime minister, and then um, later he would change it up so that it was a presidency. So I assume a, a democratic republic. I can never tell. Politics is not my forte. I just like history and geography. But... Um, he would end all political contact with Britain by 1956, mostly because, well, one, because Britain was in control of them for so long against their will, and also Britain was very much in support of Israel, which Egypt was not, which if you don't know why, it's because the Palestinians living in that area were Muslim, are Muslim, they're still there, and the Israelis treated them very, very poorly, the Israelis being Jewish people, so the Egypt, the Egyptians would stand up for the Muslims, as did many other Muslim countries in the area. Let's see. The um, second Arab-Israeli war broke out, and the uh, Israelis occupied the Sinai Peninsula and made it part of Israel, which, of course, Egypt wasn't happy about. They lost that pretty bad. They tried to form a union with Syria, called the United Arab Republic in 1958, trying to become one country to stand up to Israel, but that fell apart by 1961. In 1967, after a tip-off from the Soviets that the Israelis were going to attack Egypt, Egypt decided to attack first. And this was known as the, oh no, that was the Yom Kippur War, sorry, that's coming up later. <laughs> this was the Six-Day War. Um... Egypt lost, lost, Egypt lost, Egypt lost their territory in the Gaza Strip during the Six-Day War. The Yom Kippur War would be in 1973. That's when they did a surprise attack on Israel. Um, Nasser at that time had passed away. The president at the time was Anwar Sadat. And the, the Yom Kippur War was a disaster for Egypt. Um, Israel came back and fought them incredibly hard and defeated them very badly. So uh, Sadat sat down with Israel and negotiated, um, mainly at Camp David in the United States, at the Camp David Accords, and they decided to agree to peace in exchange for the Sinai Peninsula. So Egypt got the peninsula back and the Suez Canal back, most importantly. And they agreed to not have war with Israel and would recognize Israel as a legitimate country, which many people were not happy about. Um, and where Sadat was assassinated in 1981 because of it, and it soured a lot of relations with other Arab nations because of it. Since then, there's been um, a bit of an interesting government. Um, Hosni Mubarak would replace Anwar Sadat. Um, he was accused of a lot of corruption, accused of a lot of torture of people, and there were multiple terror attacks and riots during his time. But he held a firm grip until 2011, when the Arab Spring protests broke out in such a way that Mubarak fled Egypt. And it was a successful protest. They started to rebuild the government, but uh, the Muslim Brotherhood managed to get a foot in the door 
in the new government and tried to start their own party. That led to a lot of protests. That led to a lot of reorganization of this brand new government. In 2014, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi was elected president, and he still is to this day. The main issue with Egypt, or one of the main issues at least, is the dam in Ethiopia. Ethiopia built the, the Renaissance Dam on the Nile to create um, energy and electricity for Ethiopia, but Egypt vastly worries that this will ruin the flow of the Nile, which they've been depending on since the dawn of human history. It's a bit of a contentious point, but that is where we are in Egyptian history. Ooh, I just flew through that. That was a lot of history to go through <laughs> that I just summarized. Um, that was kind of intense. Um, let's look through the book <laughs> and see some cool pictures of Egypt. Now this book, ooh, look at all of these yummy, yummy veggies. This book came out in, I want to say, like 2000, let's see. Let's see, let's see. 2007. So a lot happened in Egypt after that. So um, we're not going to really read anything, but um, we are going to look at the neat picture. Let's see. The beautiful Nile River. And growing some cotton on the river. We're working hard in a rural school here. And this is a map of Egypt. Oh, they've got lots of vegetables, potatoes, and green beans, it looks like. <laughs> Cute face. And here are some archaeologists digging out a tomb in the Valley of the Kings. Beautiful, beautiful Cairo. That's a neat picture. And the Nile River doing what people have been doing for thousands upon thousands of years. The white desert, isn't that neat? All of that chalky, dusty ground. Here is a physical map of Egypt. You can see Upper Egypt, Lower Egypt, and various other landmarks, and of course the Nile River. The Red Sea coast, very beautiful, nice water. And the Nile has flooded in this picture. And there, oh no, they're growing rice here, how neat, in the flood water. Let's see, this city is, must be Alexandria, yeah, I saw the water. Alexandria. And this is in an oasis, looks like they've irrigated the water in it to help farm in the middle of the desert. Another little canal here in an oasis. And let's see. Oh, this is Lake Nasser, the artificial lake. And some interesting irrigation systems there. And some goats. And it says this is Mount Sinai. That's not really how I imagined it. I thought it would be more like mountains. <laughs> Not rocky, you know what I mean? I hope I made sense there. <laughs> and the gorgeous day at the beach at the Red Sea. And yeah, I suppose that's what the, the mountains at Mount Sinai look like. Just very rocky, very old, right? Here we go. The Nile River once again. Look at this. It's a little mouse. <laughs> Cute. A beautiful fennec fox, they are so sweet. And look at the horns on this ibex, that is gigantic. Wow. A very sacred cat, since you know Egyptians loved their cats. And they love their camels. I believe this is the Pyramid of Choser, the Step Pyramid of Choser in the background there. That's pretty neat. If it's not, then it looks exactly like that. I promise. There's a heron and a dung beetle, which sounds kind of gross, but they were very important symbols to the ancient Egyptians. They were good luck symbols. And an egret. 
and tropical fish and coral in the Red Sea. And of course, date palms thrive on along the Nile. Pharaoh, let's see, this is Tutmos the third. Wow. And here's a statue of a scribe. Very important people. They were like the most knowledgeable people in ancient Egypt because they went to school. Wow. And some treasures. He sees the scarab beetle there. Isn't that beautiful? Lots of amazing jewelry they had. And some new pottery too. It's an ointment jar, it says. Some hieroglyph symbols. Anyone else, when you learned ancient Egypt in school, make your name in hieroglyphs and you felt very, like, very fancy. <laughs> Ooh, who's that? That's Amun. Wow. He's a goat-headed guy. I didn't know that. I thought he was just like a guy. I didn't realize that he was a goat-headed guy. The pyramids. Iconic. And just as iconic, the Sphinx. Here's a map of ancient Egypt. You can see just how far the New Kingdom stretched. It's all in green there. Let's see if we can make out. The Old Kingdom is in purple here. And the Middle Kingdom is all the lines. Looks like they snagged these oases over there too. And this is King Tut's tomb. So apparently you can go there, I think, into the Valley of the Kings and go into his tomb. And they have um, one of his original sarcophagi left where it was, so you can still see it. And there's Queen Hatshepsut, the only female pharaoh since women were not allowed to be pharaohs. She was kind of a boss babe of history. I gotta start a series on that. And King Tut's death mask, incredibly famous. And here's Cleopatra, the last pharaoh of Egypt. See, Greek and Roman Egypt. So you can see the Roman Empire managed to stretch all the way down there. Ptolemaic Egypt was the purple line, it says. So it was all of that. It's over here. Richard the Lionheart on his crusades. Surrendering to Saladin, the leader of the Abbasid Caliphate. Napoleon invading. He came on through and fought at the Battle of the Pyramids. That's an epic name. Here's the Rosetta Stone, which was a stone that was found um, with a passage written in Greek and Egyptian and... Um, Demotic, it says. Oh, Demotic is the Egyptian writing, like the everyday Egyptian writing. What was the other language? Greek and oh, Demotic Egyptian, and then hieroglyphs. Okay, that's what it was. So that's how we managed to translate hieroglyphs, is from the Rosetta Stone. Darn, I should have... <laughs> I always think I should have dug out my tourist pictures, because I have a picture of me with the Rosetta Stone. It's really neat. <laughs> I thought it was cool. Let's see, Battle of the Suez Canal in 1942. And here's Jamal Abdel Nasser giving a speech. And let's see, Anwar Sadat with um, Prime Minister Begin from Israel and Jimmy Carter, President of the United States. Shaking hands. Peace at last. And a big protest here. This is to protest the Iraq invasion of 2003. This book came out before 2011, so there's no pictures of that, but you can imagine it looked like this, but twice as big. Let's see, the government office in Cairo. Very fancy building. Very, like, efficient. It looks like a government building. And some women voting there. Says so they gained the right to vote in 1956. People's Assembly in Session, it says. And the national flag. Let's break it down. Grab my pencil here. Egypt's flag features three horizontal bands. Red, white, and black. These are traditional Arab colors. The red band represents Egypt's history before it became a republic. White stands for Egypt's peaceful revolution in 1952. And black stands for the end of the Egyptian people's oppression. In the center of the white band is the crest of Saladin, Egypt's national emblem. 
It's a golden hawk and shield with a scroll underneath. What else do we have? Let's see. Um, people supporting Mubarak during the election. I'm sure he was the only one on the ballot. They had no choice but to support him if they wanted to support somebody. There's Cairo once again. Amazing city there on the Nile River. And there's a map of it here. Let's see. I want to find the museum because I want to go to the Egyptian museum so bad. There's the Egyptian library. Let's see, the government section's over there. Surely it's marked on here. The Citadel of Saladin, that's probably neat to see. The City of the Dead, ooh. Big old cemetery. Ramsey's the second statue. Don't see it. It's gotta be somewhere. Car route to the pyramids. It's got to be somewhere around here. Oh, well, I'll look for it later, I guess. Surely it's there somewhere. I don't know. I'll go there someday, and then I'll know where it is. Farming here looks like they've got some cabbages, lettuce. Does it say? No, it doesn't say. Leafy greens. And some oil refineries. And harvesting sugar cane. And here's the Aswan High Dam. Their currency, the Egyptian pound, and working in a factory here. A big old oil rig there, is that? Oh no, it's just a shipping. Wait, let me see this, hold on. This boat is floating. <laughs> is it just me? Okay, it is an oil rig, okay. I, it's an oil rig, it's not a boat. It looks like a boat, but it's not a boat. <laughs> Resources map right there. Lots of farming all along the Nile. Not so much in the desert. And the early morning commute. And another beautiful picture here of the Nile. And this is a boat on the Suez Canal not being stuck. <laughs> and uh, reading the newspaper. Ooh, they're out shopping for the day. And so is everyone here in Alexandria. Ooh, population map. You can see pretty much... You can see the Nile River on the population map, can't you? <laughs> How interesting. Everyone lives along the Nile. Oh my gosh, look at these faces. Look at this one. <laughs> Ooh, very proud parent there. <laughs> Such beautiful children. Oh, how gorgeous. She's got some beautiful, it looks like, um, like the, the kind of scarves that belly dancers wear around their hips, make it jingle. That's so pretty. The internet club. <laughs> this is talking about what Arabic looks like. And praying at the Coptic church. Oh, big, beautiful minarets. Look at the detail. Man, I love the detail in Islamic architecture. I wonder, what was I reading about or watching that this was meant to look like rain or something like that? These, this kind of style on the minarets? I don't remember. <laughs> I never remember where I read things. Some more wonderful faces there looking very excited. And going to the big mosque, the Al-Azhar Mosque, built in 972. And a Bedouin man doing his prayers. Oh, this must be Ramadan, yeah. <laughs> Having a big feast together after the sun sets. Oh, how beautiful. Does it say which one this is? Um, okay, these are all. This is the Muhammad Ali Mosque. Known as the Alabaster Mosque because of its alabaster walls. That is so beautiful. Man, gorgeous. The Patriarch of the Greek Orthodox Church in Alexandria, it says. Oh boy, this is the, this is Mount Sinai. This is Mount Sinai for sure. 
They have a monastery in here. I was watching videos of this place. Super fascinating. There's still monks there. And guys, do you know the, the burning bush? Like, I'm not even a Christian. I know the story of Moses and the burning bush. The bush is in here. Like the bush. And they take care of it. That's wild to me. That's so amazing. I guess it's because it's something so fragile. But they, they've got the bush. It's not burning, but it's there. This is a gorgeous synagogue. I like this. Very beautiful. Look at all the details there. Gorgeous buildings in Egypt, huh? Nice looking person there. I don't know what to say. Very pretty. I was going to say that Egyptians have been building beautiful buildings since the dawn of time, haven't they? Let's see. Lots of different spices and little spices. Breads, it looks like. I'm not sure. Very spicy spices. Here's the Egyptian museum. I want to go here so bad. They've got all the good stuff. Playing some traditional music there. And a belly dancer there. You can't see her belly, but she's belly dancing. Let's see. This is Nagib Mahfouz. Famous author. And we have Youssef Chahin, I'm not sure, a filmmaker. And they're leaving school for the day. Best time of day at school. Um, here the students are working hard at university, not just school. A very ancient board game. Is this the one that... This is like the oldest board game ever found. I'm not sure because it looked a lot like um, cribbage or backgammon, like a combination of those. the new library of Alexandria. And look at this photo, man. I want a collection of all the photos of kids playing soccer because every single picture is different and unique in its own way. They are playing soccer in the shadow of the Great Pyramids of Egypt. Come on now. That is so neat. Ooh, a big horse race here, it looks like. The Arabian Horse Festival. That's so cool. And diving in the coral reefs, that must be so much fun. The water looks so clear. A <laughs> very happy looking man. <laughs> and oh boy, he's got a bunch of, um, I was going to say non, it's Aish. Flatbread. Delicious, right? You can't go wrong with bread. Some little goats here playing a song to herd them. And a woman here wearing her niqab. And um, they are just hanging out. This is pointing out their ethnic garb, the Galabia, I think. Let's see. Just a typical day in Cairo, riding your pony through the streets. And um, it says they're sorting out flowers at an oasis. Probably to sell whatever you can make out of those. And another typical shopping day in Cairo. You can imagine all like the sounds and smells in this place, right? That's the end of the book. So that will be it for tonight. Thank you so much for watching. I moved the book so you can't see Egypt anymore. I'm sorry. I'm just going to go like this. <laughs> uh, I'll have another, actually two more videos about Egypt for you later this week, so be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you found this video relaxing and educational, and I hope that you have a very good, 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 good night. Good night. Good night.